In a previous episode, we took a look at a homemade Raspberry Pi spectrometer. In this episode, we're going to look at some brand new software, the Pi Spectrometer 2, which has some excellent new features and far greater accuracy than ever before. So let's go and take a look. Just a real quick overview for those of you that have never seen the Raspberry Pi spectrometer before. Very, very simply, I've got a Raspberry Pi 4 connected up to a Raspberry Pi camera. Uh, this is a specific type of camera. It's one with an M12 mount so that we can replace the lens with our own lens. I've got a little zoom lens mounted on here and a diffraction grating spectroscope. And that is literally all there is to it. I mean, it's, the, the physical build is as simple as it could possibly be. These diffraction grating spectroscopes are available in the UK from Patton and Hawksley, and I'll, I'll link those in down below. They're not sponsoring this episode, but these sure are nice little bits of kit, it has to be said. So the idea with this is we've got a slit at one end that we point towards our light source that we want to measure, and ordinarily you'd use your eye in the eyepiece there. Um, so all, we, all that we're really doing is substituting your eye for a camera. Um, the rest of the magic actually takes place in software, and it's the software that's, you know, that makes this a really, really useful tool. It is possible to miniaturize this. Uh, Pat and Hawksley do miniature spectroscopes and I have one here that I've also hooked up to a little uh, Pi camera, again with an M12 mount and a, a, a very specific type of lens that we'll get into when we look on GitHub. Uh, but yeah, the physical build, absolutely straightforward. It's, it's a walk in the park. I mean, it doesn't have to be all constructed on aluminium. You can 3D print a base or whatever, uh, so long as it's solid and, and when you fix things down, they stay fixed down, everything should be just fine. Anyway, let's go and take a look at the software. So this is the GitHub repository for the Pi Spectrometer 2. I'll fire this link down below so that you guys can go ahead and clone this repo and use the software. Um, the README is quite extensive. It's about weighs in at just over 2,000 words. So I'm, I'm not going to bore everybody to death by reading the contents of the README today. Um, I'll leave that as an exercise for you guys. I just want to cover the main points real quick. Um, this is released under the Apache 2.0 license, so it's free and open source. Um, you, you know, I'm happy for you guys to modify the source code and do with it as you wish, as long as you credit the author. Um, we'll scoot down a little bit. So yeah, this is a more advanced, way more advanced, uh, but more flexible version of the original program. It changes the spectrometer from basically an educational toy into a serious instrument uh, that can easily compete with commercial units costing thousands of dollars. Um, I've got a little screenshot here of, of uh, what you'd expect when the software is running. Um, I'm just going to go through the bullet points of what's new and talk a little bit about those. Um, we've got higher resolution. Uh, so previously the software was limited to a 640 pixel wide um, graph and this is now 800 pixels. I think if we go any higher it's just silly and we're just, we're just wasting data. I don't think that the spectroscope itself is really capable of uh, resolving sub nanometer stuff. Um, but yeah. We've got three row averaging of pixel data um, as a way of um, averaging with real data rather than applying software filters after the fact. Um, we've got a full screen option for the spectrometer graph. So this view that we're looking at here um, has been designed in such a way that it will display full screen on 800 by 480 screens. Um, these, these sort of um, screen resolutions are really, really common for the uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, and so it seemed like a sensible choice. Um, what else have we got? We've got third order polynomial fit of calibration data for accurate measurement. So the previous version used two data points um, to sort of compute all of the wavelengths for every single pixel. And this is not a very accurate way of doing this, um, given that the, uh, the spectrum that we get from a diffraction grating or a prism or anything else is actually inherently nonlinear if we're projecting onto a flat sensor. Um, on top of all that, we've got lenses and all sorts of other stuff in the way that, that contributes to nonlinearity. So if we do a third order polynomial fit, we end up with very, very accurate, um, uh, like best fit curve of the calibration data, which is excellent. Um, I've got improved graph labeling. Um, mainly this is just little flagpoles that drop down from the peaks. Um, and this is to ensure that, you're, you, that you, there's no ambiguity when you're reading where these labels are supposed to be matching in terms of the actual peaks. Um, we've got labeled measurement cursors, which I'll demonstrate shortly in the software. Um, so you can actually arbitrarily measure any point on the graph um, that you like uh, just by hitting the M key. Um, we've got an optional waterfall display for recording spectra changes over time. So if you're taking a look at the light source um, that you expect will change in intensity or even wavelength, uh, you can actually take a look at that, which is really, really nice as well. Uh, there's key bindings for all operations. I've ditched all of the TK stuff that we had before because people wanted it full screen. Um, ditched all of the TK controls, so no buttons and no sliders, but we've got key bindings to control everything. 
um, so that's just fine. Uh, for the Pi Cam itself, we've got the option of analog gain control. So if we're looking at particularly dim light sources, uh, you can jack up the gain and take a look at those. Obviously, there's a, there's a trade-off there or a caveat, if you like. If you turn up the gain on the Pi Cam, the signal becomes quite noisy. So if you want to look at dim sources, fine, but be aware that you're also going to be looking at um, sensor noise as well. All of the functionality of the previous version has been retained, including peak hold, peak detect, uh, the Savitsky Gole filter and the ability to save graphs as ping and data as CSV. Um, yeah, very cool addition to this is waterfall display and there's a little screenshot here of a waterfall display looking at a fluorescent lamp and you can actually, you know, just by looking at the waterfall display, you can see that there's been a, a couple of dips in brightness and a, a, an increase in brightness as time's gone on. Uh, this graph rolls from top to bottom and we'll see this shortly as well. Um, just as an additional um, bit of information for you guys, here's a waterfall display looking at the tunable output of a dye laser. So this is a dye laser, uh, laser in Kumarin 1, and I'm tuning it all the way from violet through to green and then back again. And we can see that on the waterfall display. Uh, currently, the waterfall display uh, doesn't, there's no option in the software to export all of that data to CSV. But if you want it, leave a comment down below and I'll implement it. I'll talk about hardware very, very quickly, but I'm not going to spend too much time on this because it's all documented in the readme. Just wanted to point you to the right place if you're looking to build one of these things. Um, yeah, I've provided links for where you can acquire the bits and pieces. So for the spectroscope itself, you can get those from Pat and Hawksley and there's a link to the product there. For the Pi camera with an M12 thread, there's a link to the Pi Hut. Uh, this is a UK company, but I'm sure if you're in uh, the US or Canada or Australia or anywhere else in the world, you can pick up uh, Pi cameras with, uh, with M12 mounts on them. The CCTV lens uh, doesn't actually have a link because the sellers on eBay, eBay is always in a state of flux. And so people will sell zoom lenses for a, a few weeks or a few months and then the link breaks um, because they've closed up shop and somebody else jumps in. But yeah, basically search eBay for an F1.6 zoom lens with an M12 thread, assemble it as per the images and you're practically done. Um, there's Again, a little uh, set of links if you want to build the miniature version of this. If you want to build a standalone version of this, and this is why we wanted this thing full screen, um, I did a little setup here with a Hyperpixel 4 um, uh, TFT screen running at 800 by 480 resolution, and it is an excellent little instrument. Um, you could easily build a handheld or bench top spectroscope with this, um, and it would be fantastic. Once you've completed the physical build of this, it makes sense to just do a, a quick test to make sure that the camera works and make sure that the uh, diffraction grating spectroscope is mounted correctly. So we can run this handy little command. Um, this is part of the new uh, lib camera library. So we'll just paste this in there and run it and we'll get a preview of our uh, view. I've currently got the, um, the, the Pi Cam stroke um, spectroscope assembly pointed at a fluorescent lamp because we've got clearly defined lines to look at. So we'll just need to straighten that up real quick and pull the focus. And this is the rationale behind, part of the rationale behind using the zoom lens as well because um, it's much easier to focus things. Right, there we go, yeah. So now we've got a view down the spectroscope with our Pi Cam, we're ready to take a look at the software. So let's dive in and take a look at the software. First job is to clone the repo. We need to install a single dependency, which is Python 3-OpenCV, but that's it. Um, it says, note that this build is designed for Raspberry Pi OS Bullseye. So if you're using the PyCam version of the software, it will only work with the new libcamera based Python library, PyCamera 2. The old libraries are now deprecated and it makes sense to be working with the new ones, although, well, they're still in beta as well, but um, whatever. Um, I have actually provided two versions of this software. Uh, one is specifically for the PyCam 2, which we'll look at today. And there's a second version which will work with external USB cameras. Uh, so if you've got your own camera, I don't know, you've managed to pick up a black and white USB camera or whatever, and you want to run it on the Pi, you can. Um, this will also work with any Linux box as well, so long as Python 3 is installed and Python 3 OpenCV is installed. Um, yeah, clone the repo, run the software. So I've already cloned this. Uh, let's just run it real quick. Excellent. Um, so there we are. We've got a nice resizable window. We can actually drag this um, out to really sort of vast proportions if we like, um, which is very, very nice. Um, yeah, excellent. There you are, full screen. Awesome. The next job is to perform calibration. So currently this is uncalibrated. When you first download this software, it's always in an uncalibrated state. Once we've performed calibration, however, it saves the cal data 
and every time the software starts after that, it's, it's all nicely calibrated. So let's have, just have a quick look at calibration. Um, yeah, this is, this is quite a chunky readme, right? Um, basically, if we're pointing at a light source that we know about, we, we know what it comprises of. So a fluorescent light source has these discrete lines and peaks that are all picked out. Um, we can actually calibrate it against that rather than faffing around with lasers and stuff. Um, there's a very, very useful graph on Wikipedia that we'll take a look at. Let's just get to it. Um, this graph, if we take a look at these graphs side by side, we can identify that this peak over here is the one labeled one on here. This peak here is the one labeled two. Uh, these two here are peaks four and five. The one over here, uh, this tall peak is number 12. Yeah. And so if we scoot down the list, we can see that peak one um, should be 405.4 nanometers. Peak two should be 436 point odd and so on and so forth. So we can just read these off. So very, very quickly, I'll go through these peaks and just label them. So we go back to the window, we press P, we'll get nice little pixels crosshair, and we can line up with the first peak. We've got to take our time with this, don't want to rush. Um, there we go. And we can go to the next peak and click on it. The flagpoles are very, very useful for lining up the crosshairs. I'm only going to do a sample of these peaks. We only need four or so to do a proper calibration. And we'll come over here and grab that one as well. We just get right on top of it and just for good measure we'll have this. So we've labeled one, two, three, four, five peaks and so we can just go through the graph and go through the list and label these things. So we press the C key to calibrate. It'll come up with the pixels that we're looking at. It freezes the graph. That's fine. Uh, 405.4. Done. Um, our second one here is 436.6. 436.6. Um, our third one is way over here, and that is this Mercury line. It's number five in my list here, 546.5. But again, you know, you can use the Wikipedia graph to compare these things. Um, where are we? 546.5. And the next one over here is 611.6. And the last one is 631.1. And then we hit, we hit enter and it will rescale the graph for us and start reading off proper values. We'll just get rid of the pixel points. So now this is reading 436.7. So we're off by 0.1 nanometers, right? Not too bad. Um, there's a number that's printed out in the console here called R squared. This tells us how accurate we were at picking our data points. Essentially, the closer this value is to one, the better our calibration was. So we've got what we got there, like one, two, three, four, five, nine. So close enough, right? Um, excellent. So we're all calibrated. That's it. Um, if we scooch down a little bit, um, we'll be able to see, you know, the, the, the rest of the calibration procedure essentially, but yeah, not, not too far off. Um, yeah. So in, in the thing that in the, in the, uh, in the graph window that we've got here, if we actually now compare this with all the known wavelengths that we've got, um, we have got, let me see, we've got a peak over here. Um, it looks like number nine. It's either eight or nine. It were one of the two. And according to my calibration, this should be about 588 nanometers. Um, so if we scooch down to nine, 587.6. Um, so 588, we're 0.4 nanometers out. Um, that's pretty damn good going, it has to be said. Um, we've got a, a rounded peak here. So this will always be never perfectly accurate. Um, we're reading about 488. And if we scroll, scroll back, this is picks, uh, point number three on the graph. And if we scooch down 487.7, so 488 is, oh, it's, it's actually flicking between 487.7 and 488. So it's pretty spot on. Um, it's done a really excellent job of calibrating across the entire remainder of the spectrum here. And it's, it's really nice to have a piece of software that is now this accurate. Excellent. Now that the software is all calibrated, it will actually retain the calibration uh, between restarts. So if I press Q now to quit the software and do a quick LS, We'll see a new file called caldata.txt and if we cat it we can see our calibration points so we've got 405.4 at 40 pixels 436.6 at 130 pixels and so on and this is the data file that's read in when the program starts um, let's start the program with waterfall mode to see that and we'll see that the cal data is re uh, retained Excellent. So now we've got two windows open. 
Um, we can see that it's calibrated. It says it's calibrated. It's got a third order poly fit because we use more than three data points. Excellent. As the brightness of my janky fluorescent lamp changes, we can actually see those changes in the waterfall, uh, which is really, really cool. So if I put my hand in front of it and take it away, uh, we can see the dip in brightness there. Excellent. Like I said, the waterfall is a really useful addition for light sources that we think are going to change over time. If I just leave it be for a couple of seconds, um, this fluorescent lamp that I've got flickers. It's running off a little uh, high voltage supply. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit janky. But we can see the changes in brightness over time as it runs down the graph. Very, very nice. In order to demonstrate the waterfall display, I thought I'd do this quick setup. Um, everything that's visible here is actually featured in other videos on my channel, so do look around. At the back here, we've got a nitrogen laser. This was actually a repair job from some time ago, and it's being used to pump a homemade dye laser. Dye lasers, in case you've never come across those before, are actually tunable light sources. Um, you can tune them right the way across the visible spectrum, depending on what dye you actually have uh, mounted in the dye laser here. Currently, I've got uh, Rhodamine 6G, so that's tunable from green through to orange. Um, this is collimated with a lens, bounced off a mirror over here, and into an Ulbricht sphere or integrating sphere. Again, this is a, a piece of homemade kit, and I'll, I'll link in all the vid relevant videos for this stuff down below. Anyway, now that we're all set up, before we have a look at waterfall view, let's have an obligatory smoke shot because everybody likes to see laser beams. Very, very nice. Right, let's set up the uh, waterfall and we'll take a look at this thing being tuned. Now that we've got the dye laser up and running, we can see on our waterfall display there that we're emitting light at around about uh, 605 nanometers or so. And if we start tuning, we'll start tuning all the way through the yellow. We can see it changing on the graph. Very, very nice. This is epic, it has to be said. And there's about our tuning limit, so we can tune back. We'll tune back pretty fast now. Very cool. So we've recorded like the entire tuning range of Rhodamine 6G very, very, very easily indeed. Very nice. Let's try, let's try another die. So I've got another die set up in the die laser here. This is Kumar M1. And again, we can see on the waterfall display that it's currently emitting in the green. And as we start tuning, we can tune all the way down to the blue. Again, real nice. You can see that the beam sort of the wavelengths sort of split off into two uh, in the middle of the tuning range. That's because I'm pumping this dye laser a little bit hard. But we can get right down. I think that's about the limit of the tuning range. And then we can tune back again. Absolutely fantastic. As a way of visualizing data, it has to be said that the waterfall display is, is very, very nice indeed. The most frequently requested feature for the previous version of this software was the ability to run the spectrograph in full screen mode, and that's exactly what this software is capable of. I've got a very, very cute setup on the bench here. This is a Raspberry Pi 3B Plus with a Hyperpixel 4 inch display on top of it. These are very, very nice displays, it has to be said. They're really contrasty and, and you know, pin sharp. Very, very nice. And then connected to that, I've got a miniature version of the Raspberry Pi spectrometer. Uh, this would make, you know, you could easily shoehorn this into a little box for a handheld device or a benchtop instrument. Uh, the only hurdle you'd have to overcome is being able to control this software appropriately. You obviously still need a mouse and a keyboard to do the calibration and you need a keyboard to run the uh, software. But, you know, I suppose you could uh, set up a little Teensy as a head device and send it the appropriate commands and have that all hooked up to buttons. Uh, but yeah, it totally paves the way for a very, very compact and portable instrument, it has to be said. Thanks for watching this episode of Leslie's Lab. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit like and subscribe down below, and I'll see you guys next time.